Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the second EU Asia Vision Law Forum. My name is Jae Lee. I am assistant professor at the Faculty of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. We call it CUHK Law. So this event is jointly organized by CUHK Law's Center for Comparative and Transnational Law and the Center for Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, CUHK Law CCTL is organizing a series of events, so please visit us our, our website. The idea of EU Asia Aviation Law Forum emerged when I spoke to Dr. Antigone uh, Likotafiti from Queen Mary University London in 2021. Both Antigone and I thought that it would be meaningful to have a regular forum to engage in debates on aviation law issues in the EU and Asia. This is our second edition. The title of the second EU Asia Aviation Law Forum is Aviation Law and Aeropolitical Implication of the Ongoing Conflict in Ukraine. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has generated diverse impact in the aviation market. In this forum, we'll discuss the impact from an aviation law perspective. I emphasize this because there have been a lot of academic events on Russia's invasion to Ukraine from the perspective of public international law. Our focus in this forum is aviation law. The other thing I want to emphasize is that this is an academic event. I believe academic events must be open to new ideas and an unexpected way of thinking. So be prepared. Under any circumstance, we can agree to disagree and we can disagree to agree. I will now speak about the structure of today's forum. In a, in a few minutes, Antigone will give you an overview of aviation law issues involving Russia's invasion for 15 minutes. Then I will speak about what ICAO Art Council will be like without Russia for 15 minutes. Then Mr. Jeffrey Shane will share his observation on aviation-related sanctions against Russia for 20 minutes. After Jeffrey's presentation, three of us will have an internal discussion for about 10 minutes. And after this internal discussion, there will be a 15 minute Q&A &A session, uh, which Antigone will moderate. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat window. You can send e uh, the question to Antigone. Now, let me briefly introduce our speakers. Our third speaker, and I'll say our guest of honor, is Jeffrey Shane. For anyone in the circle of aviation law, Jeffrey doesn't need any real introduction. He has 25 years of government service accumulating with three presidential appointments in the United States, including DOT's first undersecretary for policy. In addition to other senior positions at DOT, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary for State for Transportation Affairs for four years, where he served as Chief U.S. Aviation Negotiator. He, he practiced law in Washington, D.C. for 14 years, and his most recent affiliation was with IATA, International Air Transport Association, as a general counsel for more than seven years before retiring in 2020. Jeff is still very busy, I, I know he was in US Senate two weeks ago. And among other responsibility, he's a member of F USFA's Management Advisory Council. I am the second speaker. I don't need a long introduction because I don't have much to say. I teach and research on aviation law and competition law in SUHK. Our first speaker is Dr. Antigone Likotrofiti. She is a senior lecturer in Transport, Energy, and Law at the Center for Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary University of London. Prior to joining Queen Mary, Antigone worked for OECD on transport policy issues. She was assistant professor at Tilburg University and Jean Monet postdoctoral fellow at European University Institute. And he wa she was also practitioner in leading law firm. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now ready to take off. So over to you, Antigone. Uh, thank you, June, very much. And uh, let me uh, uh, share my screen. 
So a warm welcome uh, from me as well uh, to everyone on behalf also of Queen Mary University. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, uh, present the implications of the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, for aviation. So um, uh, I am not going to give you a, a lengthy uh, introduction because everything is fresh uh, in, our, in our minds. Uh, everything started in February 2014 when we witnessed the Russian invasion of uh, Crimea that led to its annexation in March 2014. It is since then that sanctions have been imposed on Russia by the international community. Uh, more than a year ago, on the 24th of February 2022, we witnessed the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, Putin presented it as a special military operation. He had in mind the three-day victory. The, the blitzkrieg didn't work, of course, and we are now in the second year of the invasion. Uh, in the aftermath of the invasion, uh, the international sanctions against Russia intensified. Um, I would also like to mention that a couple of weeks ago, the International Criminal Court issued a warrant of arrest for Putin for, and I quote from the press release of the International Criminal Court, for the war crime of unlawful deportation of population, children in particular, and transfer to the Russian Federation. So basically what is happening is that children, Ukrainian children are uh, removed from orphanages in Ukraine and from uh, care homes, and they are taken to Russia to be adopted by Russian families. This is a war crime and the, and the warrant of arrest uh, points to the um, genocidal nature of Putin's action in Ukraine. Moving on to aviation, uh, the first uh, the first measure that that in the aftermath of the invasion states adopted was to close their national airspace to Russian airlines and uh, that means that Russian airlines cannot use um, uh, the aerodromes the airports of, of of sanctioning countries and they cannot overfly these countries either these of course have uh, severe implications uh, and repercussions because, uh, Aeroflot, uh, which is the national flag carrier of Russia, and uh, uh, I think in, uh, soon after the invasion, the Russian state increased its stake, its participation in Aeroflot. So now I think it is by at least 57% owned and controlled by the Russian state. So Aeroflot used to be a member of the Sky Team Alliance, but its alliance membership has been suspended. Uh, after the after the invasion, which means that Aeroflot cannot co-chair with uh, with other airlines. Moreover, its content, so Aeroflot fares, have been removed from global distribution systems, from Saab, uh, Amadeus. So when we book our tickets uh, via an online travel agent, uh, Expedia, for example, Opodo, uh, Kayak, etc., uh, Aeroflot fares do not appear there. So Aeroflot uh, cannot um, co-chair with another airline, cannot uh, enter into blocked space arrangements, etc. If somebody wants to fly with uh, Aeroflot, they can only book their ticket on the website of Aeroflot. Another sanction that was imposed on Russia was the ban on export of aircraft. So manufacturers, Airbus, Boeing, Bombardier, Embraer, they cannot sell aircraft to Russia. Original equipment manufacturers, they cannot sell, they cannot supply, transfer air, aircraft parts to Russian airlines. Uh, and of course, to comply with this measure, what leasing companies did, what Lesource did, and I should mention here that 44% of uh, Russia's commercial fleet uh, uh, belongs to foreign lessors. So Russian airlines do not own the aircraft, they lease them from foreign lessors, and these foreign lessors they are mainly in Ireland and in Bermuda, where the aircraft are, are, bay, are registered. So what happened uh, when the sanctions were imposed was that uh, uh, the Lesors, to comply with the sanctions, terminated the leasing agreements and asked for the aircraft back. They asked for repossession of the aircraft. Another measure that, uh, that was imposed was a prohibition on repair 
uh, maintenance and financial services to Russia. Uh, so um, no technical maintenance uh, offered to Russia, um, uh, no repairs, uh, no, no, uh, uh, no advice, even vo verbal forms of communication. If you look at the EU regulation, even verbal form of communication and advice to Russia has been prohibited, no training, no knowledge transfer. And of course, there is cannibalization of aircraft in Russia uh, uh, at the moment, given that they cannot get the, the spare parts from, uh, from the manufacturers, from, from original equipment manufacturers, they cannibalize uh, aircraft, these, these leased aircraft that they have illegally appropriated uh, for, for spare parts. Now, Kremlin's response to the sanctions, well, you can imagine tit for tat retaliation. Uh, Russia closed its airspace to airlines from sanctioning countries. So they cannot overfly uh, Russia and they cannot land anywhere in Russia. Moreover, uh, a law was passed, a decree was passed, obliging uh, Russian airlines that have leased aircraft from foreign lessors not to return the aircraft. So lessees, Russian lessees, Russian airlines are not uh, uh, allowed to return the aircraft to the lessors. The aircraft, as a matter of uh, this decree, they must remain in, in Russia. Uh, and uh, this is a violation of the Chicago Convention because the Chicago Convention provides that an aircraft cannot have uh, a dual registration, cannot have two nationalities. These aircraft have been registered mainly uh, in, uh, in Ireland and in Bermuda. They have not be, been deregistered from these registries. And uh, what happened in Russia is that they were registered on the Russian registry without prior deregistration from the Bermudan and the, and the Irish registry. And this is in stark violation of uh, uh, public international law. Now we are uh, talking about approximately 515 aircraft worth uh, 10 billion US dollars. Now, what are the implications of the sanctions for aviation? Well, you can, you can think easily of some implications. Uh, obviously the Ukrainian airlines are the ones that have suffered the most given that the Ukrainian airspace is closed to civilian uh, flights, ha has been closed from, from the outset, from day one of the, of the uh, uh, invasion. And obviously airlines with an exposure to the Ukrainian market have been most affected. There are competition issues uh, in that airlines from sanctioning countries, they cannot overfly uh, Russia. And so they take long detours around Russia to reach their final destination. Whereas airlines from non-sanctioning countries, they can overfly Russia. Uh, and so there is an asymmetry there. Um, these long detours uh, obviously have uh, implications and repercussions, they entail increased fuel consumption and fuel accounts for 40% approximately of, of an airline's operating costs. We, we, we saw, uh, we, we experience fuel fl um, uh, uh, fluctuations in the price of the fuel uh, over time. Um, so this is also another parameter. Increased fuel consumption entails increased emissions. Uh, there is a time penalty that uh, passengers and airlines uh, have, to, have to pay. For example, before the invasion, a direct flight from uh, London to, to um, Japan would take 11 hours. Now it takes a direct flight, flight takes at least uh, 13 hours and 35 minutes. Right? So there is a time penalty, there is uh, passenger inconvenience. From an air traffic management point of view, accommodating the demand, and especially now that China has reopened, uh, there is um, a demand for air transportation, increased demand for air transportation. So, so it's a challenge for uh, air traffic management, for, for air navigation service providers to accommodate the, the demand within specific, within narrow air corridors and uh, uh, from a safety also perspective, there are challenges there uh, to, 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 uh, to address. Some airlines have canceled their flights. They have redesigned their network. Finnair, for example, used to fly a lot to Asia, but uh, the long detours now have obliged it to redesign its network. Um, 
airport slots. You know that the airlines do not uh, do not own the slots. They have grandfathering rights. So it's the use it or lose it principle. Unless an airline uses uh, the slots, uh, it, it, it cannot keep them for the next season. So airlines that used to fly to Russia a lot and to utilize slots for this purpose, they have to find other uses now for these, for these slots. Uh, so they have to start operating on different destinations. They are calling upon um, uh, um, slot, fa slot, um, uh, facilit uh, slot facilitators to be uh, reasonable and accommodating, but uh, slots uh, are an issue. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I think a, a very critical uh, implication concerns safety. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, Russia, Kremlin forced the re-registration in Russia of leased aircraft. Uh, and this is in stark violation of the Chicago Convention. The Chicago Convention um, uh, uh, prohibits the dual registration of aircraft, an aircraft can only have na one nationality, and this is the nationality of the country where it is registered. And it is this country that issues the, the aircraft's um, certificate of airworthiness. Without this certificate of airworthiness, an aircraft cannot fly. Uh, now these aircraft, and also the, the country where the aircraft is registered, issues also the radio station license, which is one of the documents that an aircraft can, can must always have on board. Now these aircraft that have been re-registered in Russia without prior deregistration from uh, the Bermuda and the Irish registries, they, they carry invalid certificates and licenses on board and, and there are uh, safety considerations. Uh, indeed, ICAO that has um, a universal uh, safety oversight audit program uh, has expressed its concerns uh, 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 to Russia. Uh, Russia didn't address ICAO's significant safety concern and thereafter ICAO informed its member states, its 193 member states. So think for example, what happens if an airline, um, an aircraft overflies Russia and needs a technical landing for whatever reason, for refueling, for, uh, for maintenance? What sort of spare parts can it get in Russia? What, what sort of repairs, what sort of um, technical maintenance services uh, are offered? So they are uh, very important safety issues. And final word, um, I want to mention a few things about insurance because, as I mentioned, the foreign lessors uh, asked to comply with the sanctions, terminated the, the lease uh, agreements, and they asked for the aircraft back. But the Russian airlines didn't return them. They didn't return them because also there is that decree in Russia that, that uh, uh, pre prevents them from returning them. So what the lessors did, they claimed under the insurance. They claimed under the insurance, but the insurers refused to pay. So there are lawsuits now in Ireland, in the United Kingdom, and in the United States. Now, Kremlin asked the Russian airlines that have leased aircraft from foreign lessors to purchase the aircraft, and they pledged four billion US dollars uh, from the National Wealth Fund. So they said, we will uh, buy the aircraft, we will purchase them. Just uh, uh, Russian airlines just uh, ask uh, the the lessors to purchase the aircraft. But of course, accepting that offer amounts to violation of the sanctions. So if, if the lessor gets the money, uh, they would have violated the sanctions and this entails penalties, severe penalties. So somebody can go to jail, for example. Um, now, the, the lessees, the Russian airlines, they have stated that they would return the aircraft if they could obtain government authorization. So they say, well, uh, we are in between a rock and a hard place. What can we do? But even if they were to return the aircraft, what's the marketability of such aircraft? Uh, would, you, would you lease an aircraft if you knew uh, an aircraft with uncertain um, uh, maintenance record, for example? And there are complex issues that the courts have to resolve. For example, is the aircraft a total loss? Because this is what the lessors claim, that they have lost the aircraft. Uh, uh, actual total loss, constructive co total loss, uh, have the lessors been irretrievably deprived of um, uh, possession of the aircraft? 
was there any cover? If, if there is a total loss, uh, when did it happen? After the, the termination of the agreement? And if yes, was there any cover at that point? So uh, going forward, most likely what we will experience, what the industry will experience will be higher insurance premiums. So it will become more expensive for airlines to purchase war risk insurance or risk insurance. So there will be socialization of losses. And obviously uh, this will be reflected in airfares and their rates. And I will stop there. I wish what you see in the picture and I will hand over to my colleague uh, who will uh, talk to us about governance issues within ICAO in the aftermath of uh, Russia's ousting from the council. Uh, June, you. over to you. Thank you, Antigone. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation as well as on-time performance. So I will do the same. I'll do uh, my presentation on time, which is 15 minutes. Let me share my slide. Okay, so the, the angle I'm going to discuss in this 15 minute presentation is the ICAO Council without Russia. This is what happened pretty recently, um, the last year. Then uh, I'll explain that how it's going, to, it's going to affect aviation market, aviation governance. So uh, for those of you who are not too familiar with aviation, I will start very slow, which is a function of ICAO Council, and then what the membership, the, uh, the who are the members of ICAO Council since ICAO was formed, 1947, and what happened last General Assembly, and then uh, what are the short-term, long-term effects, and then I'll conclude with a few words. So what happened? Again, for those of you who don't know anything about aviation, particularly ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, that's one of the UN's uh, special agencies uh, responsible for aviation. One of the first page in this website, uh, I think there's something was added uh, after the, the, the Secretary General, new Secretary General joined ICAO, uh, emphasized that ICAO is not a global regulator. International organization is not a global regulator. He emphasized that he, he doesn't have much power. It's really up to the state. So I, ICAO is not international aviation regulator. It's, it's a lot of powers are stemming from the state that ICAO emphasizes. Also, the, the Chicago Convention, which was overarching tree of international aviation, which was the um, starting point of ICAO, didn't say much about sanction or much about enforcement. But what happened last year at 41st the General Assembly, um, we could learn that there are other ways to show some muscle kind of enforcement indirectly. So there are two things uh, happened in, in, with regard to the, um, Russia. The first one was Assembly Resolution 41.2. It's an inflection of convention, of Chicago Convention by Russian Federation. A lot of things uh, Antigone mentioned in the previous presentation. Um, kind of repeated that. So violation of Article 1 of Chicago Convention, violation of Article 18 of Chicago Convention, which is dual registration, among others. So this assembly resolution identified the key issues that Russia violated in inter international aviation law. The other thing, what was might be most significant was the election. So Russia lost its seat in the council. So, um, and then I'm going to talk about detail uh, later. So what is council? Again, those were not, the ICAO council is one of the three bodies in ICAO, uh, council assembly secretariat, and it has various power, various function. Um, one is administrative function. This one is not too different from any international organization. So you work on management, uh, the, the function. What's interesting is a, a second and third. So for the administrative function, I'm not going into detail. Chicago Convention Article 54, 55 deal with mandatory function of council and permissive function of council. So as an organization, council is dealing with what needs to be done. Um, so these are the 55, 54. Unique things about ICAO council is its law making function, law making function. So ICAO, the 54 said ICAO council can shall adopt international standard and recommended practice in aviation we call it SAPs, S-A-R-Ps, and it deals with the various annexes, annexes to Chicago Convention, 
that deal with specifically safety related matters from Annex 1 to Annex 19. So once Annex is adopted, states have obligation to collaborate as much as possible. And then um, it still also has obligation to report if they cannot comply on based on Article 38. It also has, a council also has dispute settlement function. So they can adjudicate the dispute between contracting state if something to do with uh, Chicago Convention. The most recent one was the Qatar uh, with other neighboring Middle Eastern countries. So, you know, so I, I just here, I just mentioned that some various functions of ICAO Council. Here, I want to bring up more about political angle. What I'm saying political is who are the big country, powerful countries in, in uh, ICAO? There is the clause, Article 50, which is Composition Election of Council. The council was formed from the very beginning of ICAO. And it, the, in Chicago Convention 50, Article 50, it says that it shall compose of 21 contracting states elected by assembly. The total number of states who came to Chicago Conference 1944 was 52, 53 states. So out of those number, 21 states became the, the council members. And in each I, Chicago Convention, it says that there are three types of uh, the three category of council member. One state will achieve importance and uh, the um, contribution, large contribution, and then the geographic consideration. Difficulty is that Chicago Convention doesn't say anything about what chief importance mean. Does it mean the total volume of traffic? Does it mean the largest uh, territory? But it doesn't say anything. So because it doesn't offer any guidance how to determine which states are of chief importance, eventually it's more about um, state political judgment. So there's no objective benchmark, there's no guidance. So each state, based on their political judgment, they vote for uh, council members. So the very beginning, very first council members are as, as follows. There are 21 states, the part one, part two, part three, so eight, seven, six states were members of those council. As you see, I'm going to see uh, show um, the several slides very quickly, but the idea is that as the total number of IKEA, the states, I mean, Chicago Convention signatory increase, number of council increased as well. So it was from 21 to 27, it's largely because in, 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 this, uh, in this time, a lot of decolonization. So um, the number of state increased. So based on that, the number of council also increased. So this is in interesting. So in 1971, the number was again increased to 30, but the, the reason why it was increased was because Russia. Essentially, the, as a reaction to the fact that Russia joined ICAO in 1970, and of course they aspired for a council membership. But the established members were anxious to keep their seats. So best way to do it, best way to avoid it, increase it. So from uh, the nine to two to 10. So from 27 state to 30 state became uh, council members. Similar thing happens in um, 1980, this time with um, China. So further, because China wanted to be a, a council member and they joined the part two and um, similar reaction by established members. They were so anxious to keep their own seat and one way to avoid it, increase it. So number of council member increased from 30 to 33. These two, you know, the structure almost remained unchanged, but now the most recent one was 36. So this is current number of IK member states. And from 2004, this categorization, 11 states for part one, 12 states for part two, 13 states for part three remains unchanged. For the last 20 years, except the last assembly, what we're gonna talk about, the, the, the categorization was the same. 11, 12, 13. One of the uh, assembly was actually precise by our next speaker, Jeffrey Shane. I, he was the president of the council, uh, sorry, the assembly uh, here. 
and uh, Jeff interestingly shared his photo which he took from the president's seat. Thank you very much, Jeff, by the way. So just before the last election, last assembly, this was the membership. Again, 11 states for part one, 12 part two, 13 part three. And Russia is one of the part one states. If you look, you can look, look at those numbers, num num uh, the states, you can kind of guess that, yes, they are very powerful, influential, um, the, the stage in, in, in aviation. So what happened? What happened last year? It was quite clear from the just before the assembly, some state openly say that we are going to do something. We are going to do something and assembly. Um, Canada was particularly vocal. Um, Transport Minister openly said, we are talking to our allies and like-minded countries about what we can do to collectively respond. So also the EU also openly said that we are going to do something against Russia in the, in the assembly. So what happened was 11 candidates, 11 states uh, applied for 11 seats. Keep in mind that there are, there are 11 seats in, uh, in part one. So in other words, 11 seats for so, so 11 countries for 11 seats. Uh, you know, you can see that, well, everyone will get it because there's no competition. But as you can see that, the developed surprised a lot of people. Many, most of them got more than 100. But one, Russia only got 80. And this is a problem because based on standing rules of procedure, there's a majority requirement. So it only state that can get majority from the assembly can be a member of council. And it became quite controversial. Uh, I still remember the Saturday night, it was Saturday morning in Montreal, and I got a message from my colleague, and this is something unprecedented is happening at the moment. So the, right after the election, when he found that Russia didn't get the majority, there's a huge controversy or heated debate on how they can interpret this uh, relevant rules. Russia wanted to have a, the, another vote. And then the interpretation by ICAO was that because of the stage here, so if I, if I read it, the, four, the, the fourth sentence, in this ballot, only those contracting states which were unsex, unsuccessful in obtaining required the members, uh, the previous ballot shall be considered. So the idea was that this is not something like, um, yeah, they, imagine there are 13 states uh, running for 11 seats. Then, then maybe two or three states didn't get majority. Then they will have another, another uh, vote. It's not like 11 for 11. Otherwise, uh, situation will be one state will continue to uh, have another uh, the, the vote until they finally get a seat. So inter uh, interpretation by IKEA was, we are not going to have another ballot, another vote. So after this election, Russia made the position. They saying that unfortunately it was a bit political and uh, we got 80, um, but, the, but at the same time, we will keep the membership in ICAO. Yes, we lost a council a seat, but we will uh, keep our seat as a member of the ICAO. So this is the current, um, the, the dynamic. So 36 member state, total number unchanged, but Russia is out and more state in part two and part three. So what's the impact? What's the impact? Um, as Antigone mentioned that airlines are having difficulty, particularly operational difficulties. The EU carriers, Asian carrier flying uh, between two, 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 you know, EU to Asia, Asia to EU, used to fly over Russia. Because of detour, one hour, two hour, maximum three, four hours, delays are happening because of detouring. And Russia is the largest country in the world by far. Russia takes 10% of the land slide of, of, the, of the earth. So connectivity with Russia will create a lot of difficulty worldwide. And then third point is a sort of I think it's very important. The challenge to resolving global agenda. On the, on the right side, I, I, I took it from the IQ website. One of the global, global priorities uh, you know, IQ is focusing on is environmental protection. 
or safety and security navigation capacity. Without Russia, it's quite difficult to make a global consensus. So it's very, it's a pity that this kind of big agenda cannot be significantly moved uh, for the time being. Last one, with the council without Russia continue? In other words, we have another election in three years, in two years from now on, will the same thing happen if situation doesn't, has not been changed? Oh, I really hope that things will be better, things will be improved and um, it will be uh, back to a normal, but I cannot rule out the possibility that same thing will happen. So um, the three points in as a concluding remark. So despite the weak enforcement measures in, 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 in Chicago Convention, Chicago Convention itself doesn't say much about the power, but states, states both hold Russia to account for invasion of Ukraine and also associate violence and aviation law. So states show their muscle in by voting. As you have seen, ICAO Council is, uh, has a lot of various functions and its members represent aeropolitical power. So you see that at any given time, which country was powerful, which comes a leader in this global governance. So um, maybe because of that, Russia was not being chosen by many states. At the same time, Russia's absence from ICAO Council will likely have a long-term effect. It's quite unfortunate. So, like I, said, like I said, Russia has huge territory, a lot of influence, a lot of power in, in, in international aviation. Without Russia, many things cannot be happen. I hope that things will be better anytime soon. Thank you. I'll now over to our third speaker, Jeff Shane. Uh, thank you, June. Um, and thanks for showing the pictures that I took uh, in Montreal. And 2007, I have to say that uh, presiding over the 36th assembly that year was probably one of the premier professional experiences of my career. I look back on it fondly and I can tell you that while people may wonder whether kicking uh, Russia off the ICAO council is a very big deal, I can assure you having presided over the election that took place in 2007 to, of members of the council, it's a very big deal. And I'm, I'm, I wasn't in Montreal for this last year, but I have no doubt that it was high drama uh, in the hall as it should have been. So I was very pleased to see that result. Um, I'm a little bit uh, nervous because I'm not an academic and I'm in sharing the screen uh, with uh, two scholars. Um, it's with some trepidation that I speak with you today, but I'll, I'll try to do my best. Uh, I'm delighted to be joining you in this webinar, and I'm certainly grateful for the invitation. I'm afraid my position on economic sanctions is likely to be a bit controversial. Um, for a host of reasons that I will explain, I don't think economic sanctions should be imposed on the air transport sector. Uh, before explaining why I think that, please understand that I am not arguing against economic sanctions generally. When a country departs from commonly accepted international norms, to the detriment of its own people or other people, it's entirely appropriate for other nations to express their objections through a suspension of normal commercial relations. I will confess to having become fairly skeptical over the years regarding the actual effectiveness of those measures. Just think how, how, much, how, how, how much has not changed in places like North Korea, Iran, even Cuba, which has been subject to US sanctions forever. Uh, and others, despite years of punishing restrictions. Th that, that's probably beside the point. When a country does something as monstrous and as barbaric as what Russia has done in Ukraine, the world has to react. Still, I, I maintain that civil aviation is the one sector that should be carved out of economic sanctions and for reasons that are mostly unique to the air transport sector. It's a position that is based on a lot of personal experience, for which reason I just want to tell you a few stories. And I'm sorry, there are no slides to go with them. Uh, you will have seen that I am billed, as you've heard, as a former general counsel at IATA, uh, the International Air Transport Association. And that's true enough. 
But as uh, June Lee said, before that, I had a long career in the US government, both at the Department of Transportation and the Department of State, our foreign ministry. It was through my work in government that my skepticism about sanctions began to emerge. My first exposure to the impact on aviation of economic sanctions was in 1980 in Beijing. I was working at our Department of Transportation, DOT, and I was serving as the lawyer on an American delegation that went to China to negotiate a new bilateral air transport agreement, something the two countries hadn't had for 30 years at that time. Shortly after our arrival, as we were being bused from the old Beijing airport to our hotel, we passed a stretch of tarmac that contained a long row uh, of old airplanes. I think they were 707s, but I can't be sure. Some were missing engines, some were missing their wings, some were missing their tails and landing gear. For years prior to the normalization of relations with the United States, China's national airline, CAAC at the time, had had difficulty acquiring new aircraft or even spare parts. In order to maintain some semblance of national air service, it seemed clear that CAAC had been cannibalizing some aircraft in order to keep others flying. A lot of people in China, therefore, had been flying for years on airplanes whose airworthiness was probably not at the standard we would expect or hope for. They didn't enjoy anything like the safety of flight that we take for granted today. I didn't say anything or do anything at the time, things were already improving rapidly in China, but the image of those sad chopped up airplanes stayed with me for a long time. And I have to say, after listening to uh, Antigone Likotrafiti's uh, presentation, I'm wondering whether visitors to Russia in a few years may begin to see a similar image uh, of Aeroflot's airplanes. Another story, a few years later, I began working at the State Department. One of my responsibilities was to serve there as the chief aviation negotiator for the United States. In 1986, Congress passed a law called the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act, imposing economic sanctions on South Africa because of its apartheid system. Our president at the time was Ronald Reagan. It's mostly forgotten today, but Reagan was strongly opposed uh, to economic sanctions, he was at least imposing economic sanctions on South Africa. When the law was first enacted, he actually nullified it through a veto. Now, the U.S. Constitution allows Congress to override a presidential veto if enough votes are available, and that is, in fact, what they did. But Reagan's statement after the law was passed over his objections was interesting. Uh, I'll read it to you. The debate, he said, was not whether or not to oppose apartheid, but instead how best to oppose it and how best to bring freedom to that troubled country. He continued, punitive sanctions, I believe, are not the best course of action. They hurt the very people they are intended to help. This law will not solve the serious problems that plague that country. The United States must also move forward with positive measures to encourage peaceful change and advance the cause of democracy in South Africa. Well, South African Airways, the country's national airline, was, of course, among the companies targeted by the law. I thought it was unfortunate. South African Airways was probably the most racially integrated enterprise in the entire country, and it had been for some time. It was being punished, in effect, for the sins of others. Nevertheless, as the State Department official in charge of aviation relations, it became my job to meet with the CEO of the airline and inform him that his airline was no longer welcome in the United States. It was a meeting that I did not enjoy very much. SAA sued the US government, uh, arguing that the United States had not followed the procedures spelled out in the US-South Africa Bilateral Aviation Agreement. And that was certainly true. The agreement, like most uh, air services agreements contained a one-year notice provision, and we had ignored it. The courts held, however, that an explicit act of Congress, if inconsistent with the terms of a bilateral air services agreement, overrides that agreement. SAA asked for Supreme Court review of that decision, but the court refused to hear the case. I felt the decision called into question the value of U.S. commitments to all of our trading partners, 
but the decision remains the law of the land even today. Now, a few years later, of course, South Africa ended the apartheid policy and the world applauded. Can we say that the sanctions were effective, therefore, or did apartheid simply succumb to domestic pressure and, and South Africa's being a pariah in the eyes of most of the world? It's, it's still the subject of debate. Another story. Later on, I moved from the State Department back to the Department of Transportation. I was sitting in my office one day and I received a phone call from someone at GE Aviation, a major manufacturer of jet engines. The fan disc on one of their engines had failed on an aircraft that belonged to American Airlines. It had literally blown apart, destroying the engine and seriously damaging the fuselage. Fortunately, nobody was hurt because the aircraft was on the ground. It was simply going through some tests and no passengers were on board. The problem, the GE person explained, was with the alloy used in that component. A series of engines had been manufactured with that same alloy and GE knew which customers had purchased them. They were contacting all of the owners to perform the necessary repairs as quickly as possible. And why are you telling me this? I asked. Because, the caller said, Iran Air owns a number of those engines, and we don't know if we're even allowed to inform them of the problem. Iran, of course, was then, as now, under economic sanctions imposed by the United States and others. I said that they could and certainly should inform them as quickly as possible. Because of the sanctions imposed on Iran, however, they would not be permitted to repair the engines without, without a license from OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control in the Treasury Department. I was sure they'd have no trouble ob obtaining that permission, I said, uh, and how wrong I was. <laughs> GE applied for the license and was promptly turned down. They called me again to let me know and to ask for help. Because not repairing those engines would almost certainly put lives at risk, I felt that uh, OFAC had made a very bad decision. Long story short, there was a fundamental disagreement between two different factions of the United States government over the relative importance of economic sanctions versus the safety of life. And it took three months to resolve. GE, I'm happy to say, finally did receive the license it needed, but it took much too long. And here's my last story. After retiring from the government and practicing law for a few years, I did join IATA as its general counsel. IATA, as many of you know, is an airline trade association, the largest one in the world. What, made many, peop what many people don't know is that it is also a large not-for-profit business. Among its many products and services is a suite of back office functions that in many ways are the glue that holds the international aviation system together. For example, IATA runs a global clearinghouse through which money passes from one airline to another. For example, following an interline connection. Even if your trip somewhere involves two airlines, you buy your ticket from only one of them. The other, airlines, other airline receives its compensation uh, through IATA's financial settlement system. I discovered shortly after arriving at IATA that for the previous five years, the organization had been facilitating transactions involving Cubana de Evasión, uh, Cuba's national airline. IATA is a Canadian company and therefore not obligated to comply with U.S. economic sanctions unless the activity takes place on U.S. soil or is performed by American citizens. Alas, the transactions with Cubana had been handled in Miami by Americans and so clearly ran afoul of U.S. law. It was quite an introduction to my new job. We self-disclosed the violation to OFAC immediately. We instituted fail-safe measures to prevent similar mistakes in the future. And ultimately we received nothing more, I'm happy to say, than a stern warning letter. We were lucky. IATA continues to deal with Cubana, but now it does so at its offices in Madrid without the participation of any American citizens. Thus, activity that was illegal when conducted in Miami is perfectly legal when conducted in Madrid. That's only because Canada, IATA's home country, has not imposed economic sanctions on Cuba. If they had, transactions with Cubana would be illegal wherever they were handled. 
Canada has imposed sanctions on a number of other countries, however, and the result is that IATA, as a Canadian company, is required to freeze any funds received from the airlines of those sanctioned countries. That money is owed to non-sanctioned airlines. So the result is that the sanctions imposed by Canada on some airlines results, result in unintended financial damage to airlines that are not subject to Canada sanctions. There are a host of other transactions that IATA is prohibited from handling or even facilitating as a result of Canada's economic sanctions. The organization acts as an agent for airlines, for example, in, in paying overflight fees to air traffic management systems. But for example, it can't pay anything to North Korea. As a result, airlines avoid North Korean airspace and fly much longer routes than should be necessary. The point is that sanctions visited on countries that clearly deserve to be sanctions throw off a lot of unintended consequences and end up damaging the economic fortunes of a lot of innocent bystanders. So we finally come to the current sanctions against Russia about which you've already heard. Allow me just to talk about the US experience briefly because it's the one I'm most familiar with and it perfectly illustrates the points I'm making about the unintended consequences of sanctions when applied to aviation. As you have heard uh, from Dr. Liko Trafiti, immediately following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the United States banned Russian aircraft from US airspace. Russia predictably took retaliatory action and prohibited US aircraft from entering its airspace. As a result, US airlines traveling between the US and Asia have to fly much longer routes and burn much more fuel than would otherwise be the case. Passengers have to pay the airlines more for less, for slower flights than they would otherwise uh, enjoy. But the problems experienced by airlines don't stop there. Again, as you have heard, some of their foreign competitors in US Asia markets are not required by their governments to avoid Russian airspace, and therefore they are able to continue flying the most efficient routes. I'm thinking of Air India, for example, or air airlines from China. The sanctions imposed by the US government, therefore, have the effect of placing US airlines at a very serious competitive disadvantage. The US carriers have been complaining to the US government about this development, and it will be interesting to see what, if anything, the US government does in response. You've already heard again from Dr. Liko Trevidhi about the other adverse consequences of the sanctions suffered by entities that have done no wrong, notably the owners and lessors of aircraft that have been effectively seized by Russia without compensation. And again, the sanctions do prevent the owners of these aircraft from accepting the payment that some Russian entities have offered. Also because Russian airlines will have difficulty obtaining new aircraft or spare parts for their existing fleet, safety is likely to be compromised. We can look forward again to the cannibalization of airplanes like the, the cannibalization we saw taking place in China back before 1980. Let me just close at this point by quickly summing up why I think there are good reasons for exempting airlines from the requirements of economic sanctions. First, I don't think governments should be in the business of reducing the safety of flight, even within countries they otherwise sanctions. The lives of even more innocent people should not be put at risk by economic sanctions. Second, I don't think countries should impose sanctions that end up visiting financial harm on entities that have done nothing wrong, airlines and aircraft lessors, for example, from non-sanctioned countries. Third, I don't think countries should impose sanctions that require their airlines to fly unnecessarily long routes, thereby inconveniencing passengers, producing more carbon that would otherwise be necessary, and, and putting their own air, airlines at a serious competitive disadvantage. Finally, and I acknowledge that this is what you might call a soft point, it's not a rigorous argument, but international civil aviation is and always has been a force for good. It is a channel that connects the peoples of the world as never before in human history. I know the conventional wisdom is that when a government commits a crime as horrific as the one Russia has committed, including, and, and not let, let not, let's not mince words, the murder of innocent civilians, the instinct is always to do everything possible to isolate that country. 
to cut it off from normal commerce in the hope that it will stop its illegal conduct in order to avoid further damage to its economy. We need to ask ourselves how often has this tactic actually worked. Most of the time, I'm afraid it doesn't. The targets of sanctions are typically authoritarian governments who control the availability of information to their citizens. They are rarely influ influenced by popular protests, which they treat as crimes that are punishable by imprisonment or worse. They find alternatives to the commerce that has been cut off. They learn to rely less on imports and more on indigenous capabilities. And they forge, forge stronger alliances with like-minded countries happy to have a new customer. Of course, I know that economic sanctions are too well established a response to bad actors, and it would be naive to think that they won't continue to be the response to conduct that most of the world condemns. We have created a vast bureaucratic infrastructure for the imposition and the enforcement of economic sanctions. I just think it might be useful to treat civil aviation as an exception, keeping open that one line of connection to the Russian people, for example, who are not anyone's enemy in a way that might somehow encourage a dialogue that can't even begin in a regime characterized by total isolation. They understood this in 1944 when 700 delegates came to Chicago from around the world to write the Chicago Convention and to create ICAO. Even with the war still raging in Europe and the Pacific, they came. They knew and they said repeatedly that air transport was a force for peace. That's why they were there. They were right. And I don't think we should forget it. So thank you for listening. I'll, I'll stop there. And I am looking very forward very much to uh, our discussion. Thank you, Jeff. It was fascinating. Um, so as explained, we are going to have the internal discussion shortly. And we are receiving many questions from the floor, uh, from the, you know, all around the world. So I, I understand that Antigone had a question to Jeff. Uh, Antigone, can you? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jeff. It was it was really uh, interesting. Everything that you said. Um, I admit I don't have your experience, um, and I am a believer in sanctions. Um, so I would like to challenge you a little bit there on this idea that aviation should be carved out of the economic sanctions imposed on Russia. Um, First of all, I believe that uh, economic sanctions have a logic. And if we start carving out uh, sectors from the sanctions, we are undermining uh, the whole scheme. Um, also, you mentioned that aviation is special. This is what I also used to believe when I started, uh, when I wrote my PhD dissertation, I think I had written therein that uh, aviation is uh, special, it has its peculiarities, and therefore sector-specific regulation is justified. We need sector-specific rules. Horizon horizontal rules are not good enough. Then when I started teaching, uh, I started reading my students' dissertations, and they would say, if they focused, for example, on the telecoms uh, industry, they would say, telecoms is special. And we must adopt, regulators must adopt sector-specific rules. And then I read another dissertation on sports, on the sports industry. And the student had mentioned, well, the sports industry is special. It has special characteristics. And we need sector-specific rules. And so the regulators started adopting sector-specific rules. But now we have moved back to horizontal rules that apply across the board. So I'm wondering if we start carving out sectors of the economy from the economic sanctions, aren't we um, uh, removing from, from our arsenal a very powerful weapon? Well, that's a good question. And I, I understand uh, I understand the reasons why you, you would question carving out a, san a sanction, carving out a sector from sanctions. I would only ask, when you say uh, if you carve out aviation, it will undermine the effect of the sanctions. My question would be, how how would we know? In order to, uh, to find out that you've undermined the sanctions, you have to assume that the sanctions are having an effect that you're undermining. And the question is whether or not you are. As I said earlier, uh, I am very skeptical about the extent to which those sanctions are effective. But putting that aside, because uh, you may believe they are, um, 
why is aviation different from others? I would argue strenuously that aviation is different from sports, different from telecoms. You, you, your presentation, I think, gave the most powerful reasons why it's different, because you have you have people who are you know, exchanging equipment uh, across national boundaries with um, commercial consequences for those uh, lessors who are coming from a place that is not sanctioned, uh, who suddenly find that they've lost their equipment and they can't get money for it. Uh, <clears throat> the punishment is being visited perhaps more harshly on, on the lessors than on the airline, which suddenly finds itself, the airline in Russia, for example, that finds itself with new equipment for which it hasn't had to pay, uh, which may be better than the equipment it would otherwise be uh, able to get. So it just seems to me uh, that there is a complete uh, confusion about what the effect of the sanctions is going to be, and, and those who impose sanctions seem unimpressed by the financial harm visited on their own citizens or their own companies or the companies or citizens of other innocent states. And I, I, just, I just think it is a, uh, it's a distortion of policy that that needs to be paid more attention to and i would doubt seriously that you see that distortion to the same extent in any of those other sectors however desirable uh they think that an exception might be okay Th thank you jeff so i have a question i have a question to antigone um, yeah so um antigone so you covered the um the angle i mean you touched on touched on various framework um on, on aviation and, and we actually so far we've been focused on multilateral governance. So what question I want to ask is that what about bilateral? In aviation sector, it's being regulated by multilateral multilateralism. Um, one of them is obviously Chicago Convention, but more than 4,000 bilateral service agreement is another important angle. So can you explain that any uh, implication on air service agreement in, in, in terms of Russia's uh, invasion, so like Russia with other countries with their air service agreement. Right, yeah, you're you're right, June. There are air services agreements between Russia and the sanctioning countries, and I believe and the airlines uh, uh, exchange and the countries exchange uh, traffic rights. Right, so these air services reg uh, agreements regulate market access, amongst other issues. They regulate issues to do with safety, with security. Uh, market access, uh, commercial opportunities, a host of issues. Uh, so I guess your question is, what happens now to these bilaterals? Have they been terminated because the national airspaces are, are closed? Uh, sanctions have been imposed? Um, uh, well, I don't think that the air service agreements have been terminated. I don't think that anybody has denounced the air service agreements, but there are provisions in these air service agreements that regulate revocation of authorizations. Uh, so uh, countries can revoke uh, an airline's foreign air carrier permit, for example. I know that the UK Civil Aviation Authority has revoked Aeroflot's uh, um, foreign air carrier permit. Uh, if there are good reasons and safety is one of the reasons why such kind of uh, revocations of authorization uh, may be justified. Uh, we mentioned, I mentioned before that there is a significant safety concern that uh, ICAO uh, um, uh, pointed out to its 193 member states. So there are very good reasons uh, why countries would want to, to invoke this provision in bilateral air services agreements and uh, suspend uh, foreign air carrier permits. Um, we could say a lot of things, uh, June, because we both teach uh, uh, these things in our universities. Uh, the Chicago Convention is a multilateral instrument, that, and it has been um, ratified by 193 countries in its very first provision enshrines the principle of national sovereignty. So the principle that every state enjoys complete and exclusive um, uh, sovereignty over the airspace above its territory are, and the bilateral agreements are regulated by the Chicago Convention. So arguably a country can say, uh, Russia has clearly violated the Chicago Convention and the bilateral agreement is also regulated by the Chicago Convention. So there I have very good reasons to suspend foreign air carrier permits and uh, suspend um, um, 
the application of the agreement altogether, perhaps. Thank you, thank you. So again, we are receiving many questions. Uh, uh, we promise to be interactive. I just want to check if Jeff had any question. If, if not, we can move on to uh, the Q&A. Okay, okay. So yeah. I think from now on, uh, Antigone will moderate the Q&A, the, the question we received from the floor. Yeah, over to you. Okay, right. Uh, so I see a question here, which, which country statute prohibits the lessors buying back the deregistered aircraft? Well, I mentioned that uh, Russia passed a law, a decree that uh, uh, provides for the forced re-registration in Russia of these aircraft and, and prohibits the source, uh, sorry, let's see, so Russian airlines from um, uh, returning the aircraft, right? Um, I don't know if this answers uh, the question. Now, which country which countries statutes prohibits the lessors buying back the deregistered aircraft? Well, it's the sanctions. It's the sanctions because if the lessors uh, get the money from the Russian airlines, they will have breached the sanctions. And there are penalties. There are severe penalties uh, if they do so. I agree that uh, reportedly, I, I, read, I read in the news that some lessors have managed to take back their aircraft. And perhaps there have been some transactions there, uh, but uh, um, I'm not sure um, what is going to happen and how this happens and whether this is in violation of the sanctions. Uh, there is a question, and perhaps Jeffrey and June uh, uh, may wish to tackle it. Uh, it concerns relations between Russia and China. Uh, what what is the impact of of the war between Russia and Ukraine on aviation traffic and aviation relations between Russia and China? Uh, I don't know if uh, any of you would like to uh, address this question. Well, I, I can just jump in and say we're all aware that uh, President Xi recently visited the Kremlin uh, for the first time. I think you know maybe ever or maybe in a long time. Uh, as I was saying, one of the problems with sanctions is it, it drives the sanctioned country to find new allies or to strengthen alliances with like-minded states. And I think you're seeing that effect take effect. Uh, you're seeing that effect in, in, the, in response to the sanctions on Russia. Uh, I can't speak to uh, what the implications are for aviation of that closer alliance. Um, my guess is that there is ample uh, Air service between uh, between Russia and China. I'm sure there has been for a long time, so I don't know whether there's any effect there. But uh, we see a broader effect in the in the apparent strengthening of the alliance between these two countries. Yeah. Yeah. Also, another thing I can share um, is that I had I talk. I, a good friend of mine is working in Moscow at the moment. He's a Korean diplomat working in Moscow. So I gave out talk, uh, what, what, what's your, your life like? And one thing I found very interesting was connectivity between Russia with East to West was affected dramatically. So, you know, to, US, to Europe, to US, very, very uh, none, you know, nearly none. But then he mentioned that to North South, from Russia to South, like China or other parts of Asia, uh, were not too affected. And then it is important for Russia for the supply chain because of those connectivities between South, uh, they kind of provide sort of the supply chain they needed. So um, this relationship between um, Russia and China, of course, with, with much broader, uh, the, the, the issues are here, so I can't really talk about that. But for the aviation the perspective, definitely Russia-China relationship has been closer, intensified uh, in this uh, e e e Ukraine crisis. Right, thank you both. And uh, there is a question about Aeroflot in particular. Um, so um, on the website of Aeroflot out of the 180 aircraft uh, in the fleet, uh, apart from two, uh, the rest are Boeing and Airbus aircraft. They are still flying, and change to Russian-made aircraft uh, take, uh, takes time. 
uh, could you uh, outline how this situation uh, is dealt with in practice by the airline? Well, indeed, this is what I have also uh, read, that um, Aeroflot's aircraft uh, uh, come from Boeing, from Airbus, I think 3% from Embraer, and 4% comes from um, um, uh, um, Bombardier. It takes time to switch to Sukhoi um, aircraft. I know that they use Sukhoi for, for domestic transportation, and they have announced plans in Russia to... to build more Sukhoi aircraft and, and to Polev. It takes time. Um, um, how the airline deals with this situation? Well, I think they are stuck with the aircraft they have uh, and they cannot even repair them. Uh, so I see a deterioration really of the quality of the fleets. And in any case, uh, their, their route network is severely uh, curtailed due to, the, due to the sanctions. So they fly domestically and they fly to specific destinations uh, uh, internationally. Uh, so it's, it's a blow for the airline. Um, another um, uh, question here, I took a flight last month from New York uh, to Hong Kong uh, by the major airline in Hong Kong. A note from the flight path, it flew um, through the eastern part of Russia for the polar route. So is the airspace in Russia sort of separate into flying zone and no flying zone? Right, the polar route and whether in Russia there is a flying zone and a no flying zone. This is what I have read uh, as well, that there are specific um, uh, uh, zones within which foreign airlines can fly. Uh, and within which foreign airlines cannot fly. I don't know if any of the, uh, if, if Jeffrey or June uh, uh, would like to add more to this, to this uh, answer. No, that sounds like a technical question uh, about uh, air traffic management in Russia, <clears throat> excuse me. And I, I don't think I can. I would think that that was always the case. Uh, the question now is whether or not a US and other airlines from some of the sanctioning countries can use any of those zones? And the answer is no. Uh, they have to go around completely. I suppose if it was Cathay, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe you know whether Cathay is. I don't think Cathay is observing the sanctions. So uh, there's no reason to think that that flight would have been any different. That's what the US airlines are complaining about. They, they have difficulty competing effectively with airlines that can fly much more efficiently over Russian airspace than they are allowed to do. Um, perhaps I, I could uh, say here that, for example, um, Japan has imposed its own sanctions and it has prohibited, it hasn't, uh, uh, Russian airspace is not close to Japanese airlines, but uh, Japan has prohibited uh, payments into Russia. So this is why my understanding is that Japanese airlines avoid overflying Russia because if they need to land somewhere for refueling if, if, or if there is an emergency, then they will not be able to purchase, to pay for anything, right? So they may take a detour. Um, so uh, now you have mentioned the polar route. Um, uh, I had read in the newspaper, uh, um, I think a year ago that, uh, uh, a flight from uh, London to Tokyo, for example, uh, uh, which used to take 11 hours uh, before the sanctions can take 16 hours if the polar route is, is followed. So if the airline goes up to Scotland, uh, overflies Iceland, Greenland, Arctic Canada, um, Alaska, Pacific Ocean, and then uh, Japan, 16 hours, right? And then at some point when you overfly the Pacific, you also uh, lose a day en route because there is the international date line. So a lot of uh, inconvenience, much inconvenience for, for the passengers. Now let's see what, what else are, um, are attendees asking. Um, any points of view on impact on aviation global data harmonization? Global data harmonization. I'm wondering whether you, you mean the global distribution systems, uh, uh, whether this is whether your this question points to the digital divide. I'm not at all sure. I don't know, Jeffrey, uh, June, are you able to 
offer any view on the impact on the aviation global data harmonization? Uh, I'm not sure I can. I know that uh, certainly the Russian airlines are kicked out of uh, the global distribution systems that they were participating in before. Um, but that doesn't sound like a response to the question very specifically. I think if we're talking about harmonization of data, uh, I, I don't, it's, a, it's an interesting question, but I don't really have an answer. Um. There is a very difficult question here that I don't think I understand. Is there a jurisprudential link in the principle of just terms that the Chicago Convention touches on with preventing dual nationality registration of aircrafts and uh, ITAA purchases, etc.? Uh, uh, June, you sent me this question. Somebody uh, probably sent it to you somewhat rephrased. Uh, right. Are you able to? To address this question. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually trying to figure out the meaning of the question. Uh, those who sent the, the, the question, can you uh, make it more uh, straightforward? But I think I kind of repeating what Antigone said, but the, the, the starting point of is Chicago Convention Article 18, right? So unlike person, we can be dual citizenship, but aircraft cannot have more than one. So one, one registration, the dual registration by itself, it's a violation of Chicago Convention Article 18 as a starting point. So do uh, miss Princess Krista, but please rephrase your question. There should be no doubt about why that rule exists because uh, international civil aviation is predicated on the, on the requirement that each airline or each airplane of every airline be regulated by a single identifiable regulatory authority. You can't have it divided between two, which would be the case with dual registration. The whole system depends on our understanding the quality of that regulation. Are the regulators complying with ICAO standards or not? And that's countries need to understand that in order to know whether or not uh, the airlines that are flying to their territory from other countries are complying with the standards that they would insist upon, global minimum standards at, a, at an absolute minimum. So that's, I don't know if that's a jurisprudential or a a logical reason, <laughs> maybe both, but um, it's certainly one of the important reasons for that rule. Certainly, certainly. And, uh, and there is a good question regarding competition, how to deal with the unfair competition due to uh, the, the closure of national airspaces. Is there any real chance to assess the issue or does we leave it as a matter of free market? Uh, what do we do about uh, competition distortions and the unlevel playing field that is created due to these asymmetries? Um, uh, anybody yeah. wants to? Can I, can I take a, a stab at that? Because I think it's a really interesting question and I think it bears watching because the US government, again, uh, has received complaints from US airlines about the, the competitive disadvantage that the sanctions have created for them. So um, Air India is flying over Russian territory to the United States. What does the U.S. government do about that, knowing that Air India is, in effect, uh, flying over territory that the U.S. government has prohibited U.S. airlines from flying over? Does it say a condition for landing in the United States is that you do not fly over Russian territory? I mean, that would be the logical response. The question is, is there any legal basis? for saying such a thing. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer. I don't, my first answer is it would be a hard one to justify in terms of aviation law. Um, but it may be that in, in a case like this, uh, because we're dealing with a fundamental violation of international law and the invasion, all bets are off. And the, the US government just says, you know, we just don't want anybody flying over Russian territory. And therefore, that's a condition for flying to our territory. You don't have to fly to our territory if you don't want to, if you don't want to comply with our rules. Uh, again, it, it'd be very controversial because it's not anything that the bilateral agreements or the Chicago Convention would justify, I don't believe. But it may very well be seen as an exigency. We'll just have to watch and see what the US government does. 
Right, and there is a related point there. Uh, it seems that the Russian ban also forbids code sharing with any American airlines overflying the Russian airspace. I believe what the, what the question means here is that American airlines cannot code share with airlines that that's, can still overfly Russia. Uh, that distorts the market significantly. That goes beyond the revocation right under air service agreements. How can that be handled by the airlines? Uh, the, well, the prohibition, if I can just jump in, the prohibition simply prohibits the airline from carrying a passenger uh, that began or bought its ticket from a, a US carrier, I think. We had a recent case involving Virgin Atlantic, which uh, code shared with Delta Airlines and carried Delta passengers, piece of people carrying Delta tickets over Iran, which uh, Delta is not allowed to do. If Delta is not allowed to do it, it's not allowed to sell tickets that involve that, that transportation over Iran. And I think that would be exactly how it works in the case of Russia. Right, and there is something which is called secondary sanctions. So to strengthen, I believe, the, the force of the, of the economic san sanctions, what states could do later would be to impose secondary sanctions uh, on countries that do business with Russia. And perhaps the, the ripple effect uh, will reach aviation. And uh, I, I know that Jeffrey doesn't even want to think about it. Um, I cannot see, see any other question. No, I see one from a legal perspective. Will force, force, force de majeure allegations solve the, pro the problem? Um, force majeure, I, I don't really know what you mean. Uh, um, yeah, we have an invasion as... as uh, Jeffrey mentioned all bets are off, so uh, I'm sure these arguments are going to be utilized, not least by Russia, but I'm not going to offer here any legal arguments to Russia. I know that we are being recorded, so uh, I wouldn't elaborate, I wouldn't amplify. As you uh, mean, I, I have a question. Can I, can I ask a question to Jeffrey? So, uh, Jeffrey, so um, because you're more familiar with sort of long-term sanctions, you know, you talked about South Africa, Iran, uh, the Cuba as well. So of course, there's no crystal ball. There's no crystal ball here. But uh, do you can you share your view that how the sanction will end eventually? The sanction against Russia, uh, and of course, it's affected by a lot of external factors. But sanction against Russia in this aviation uh, the field. Do you have any sort of prediction that how it's going to end in the end? Well, I think by a satisfactory resolution of the conflict between Russia and, and Ukraine, and what the details of that are, of course, I can't begin to predict. It's not just the invasion of uh, the invasion that began last year or 2021. It's the uh, it's the annexation of Cyprus, uh, Cyprus, of Crimea, and um, I just don't know you know what might be on the table. Question is whether or not the parties agree that that the conflict is settled. And I suppose once, once there is that agreement, if Ukraine is satisfied with the outcome, then there'd be no continuing reason to maintain sanctions on Russia. And just a quick follow-up question. So when the, you gave example of South Africa, so when they fixed it, how quickly the world react? I mean, well, as soon as they finished, then they just sanctions ended? Oh, almost immediately. The law listed a bunch of conditions that had to be met uh, in order for the sanctions to be withdrawn, and they had been met. And so uh, almost immediately, the sanctions were withdrawn. Again, I, I'm not entirely sure whether the sanctions were the reason why uh, they met those conditions. Uh, there were lots of other reasons for South Africa to abandon that policy. Uh, as I say, it's just a matter of, of debate even today as to whether the sanctions were really responsible for the change. I think, I think, Jeffrey, if I may challenge you again uh, a little bit, um, I think you are very optimistic. You see a win-win. I don't see a win-win in this, in this uh, case. There is somebody, uh, as far as I'm concerned, who is right and somebody who is wrong. 
So the outcome will be win-lose. And I think the win-win outcome would be to liberate not only Ukraine, but also Russia from Putin's tyranny. Uh, mm. So I, I think this will take longer. And uh, uh, perhaps the sanctions will be in place for much longer. I, I, um, uh, I certainly do not wish so, but uh, I, I certainly fear it. No, I understand your point. I just, I just think, as a matter of uh, international law, if there is no conflict, it's a technical matter because the two sides have signed an accord of some kind that ends the uh, ends the conflict. There, what would be the the legal basis for continuing the economic sanctions, even if it's not what we would regard as a satisfactory outcome in the great scheme of things? Right, right. If there is an accord, but to get there, I think it will take time and and oh, pain. No, I I agree with you. I don't think this is going to happen anytime soon. Um, just as none of the other sanctions have gone away anytime soon, it's still there. Um, it's it's a very difficult situation. And by the way, even though I I make arguments about exempting aviation from from uh, global economic sanctions. I don't expect that it will ever happen. I am really just making a logical argument from my the perspective of my experience and from the experience that so many innocent bystanders, again, are having right now as a result of the imposition of sanctions on Russia. Thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, June, I think we have tackled all the question. I don't know if you would like to pose another question yourself or Jeffrey, or any remarks that you would like to make. No, this is, uh, I, I, like I said at the beginning, I, this is an academic event. I really wanted to uh, set a stage that we can agree to disagree. It's, you can disagree to agree. And there are many issues that we cannot agree for sure. Uh, but I think received that the question from the, the floor in different angles. So I'm, I'm glad that we had a relatively interactive session. But um, as we, all, I mean, always, only arrival is on time performance. So we are going to arrive very soon. So yeah, I'm happy for that. Thank you, June. So I guess it's time to close the webinar. I would like to thank Jeffrey Sane for uh, taking the time to talk to us today and to share his insights uh, with us. Uh, Jeffrey is an expert in the true sense of the words uh, in aviation. He understands aviation. He knows aviation inside out. So it has been an honor to have you with us, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to my good friend, June, at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, who is the architect of the EU Asia Aviation Law Forum and the driving force behind uh, today's events and behind all of the joint activities, uh, everything that we do together. Thank you, uh, June. And I would like also to thank our attendees all over the world. Mm -hmm.